Hola, ahora sí. Eh. Good morning, everyone. We will now start with a tutorial on new trends in secure routing. I'm Guillermo Siciliano. I'm a member of LACNIC staff. I work in R&D at LACNIC. With me are Erika Vega, with whom we'll be giving this tutorial. Erika is a consultant at Consortium, and she is a board member of LACNOG's board. So we'll be throughout this morning session together speaking about secure routing. Now, before we start with this tutorial, I will speak to the, refer to the other tutorials we have this morning. In the Nueve de Julio room, we have the hackathon activity. and the Joan Avalanche 4 room, we have universal acceptance and DNS. Hackathon and Joy Lunch 3, the interactive workshop, how LACNIC manages its internet resources and how can you influence that. And here in this room, we'll be starting with the tutorial on new trends in secure routing. So the idea for this session is to make a basic introduction to set the context. Firstly, which are the incidents, the most frequent issues, how these occur, how we can solve these things, and how, which are the things that are being used today to improve security in the internet and VGP security. after some of the more theoretical presentations that have to do with how internet works and how we can improve that, we'll be make a couple of practical demos and we will be having breaks as we go along so you can ask all, uh, your questions. Well, we get everything set. As I was telling you, what we're going to do in this initial session is what are the most frequent routing incidents in the internet and what proposals we have today to solve these. So what we are doing at present and later on, we'll, after the coffee break, we will see what is being proposed to figure out solutions to this. this.
bueno, ahora sí. Eh. As I was saying, the first thing we will be speaking of are what are the most common routing incidents. To start, Bueno, eh, como les decía, los incidentes. Yeah, as I was saying, the most frequent routing incidents. So we will start looking at the most frequent routing incidents. Now, the first one is route hijacking. What is route hijacking? the action of announcing prefixes that we are not authorized to announce. So announcing prefixes that for some reason shouldn't be announced to the internet or that we're not authorized to do so. This can be as a result of misconfigurations or an intentional error. So there are two uh, the, you can have the two situ situations. You can have intentional route hijacking or route hijacking as a result of configuration. So maybe you are in the midst of an operation and this can occur, but also you have cases in which you have there are route hijackings with the intention, a specific intention for stealing cryptocurrencies or redirect DNSs or uh, obtain a prefix where you have public DNSs and then changing, changing things there and redirecting traffic elsewhere. Now, what does this consist of? This is an autonomous system topology, systems that are connected with one another. So you have this customer you have here on the left wishes to reach the address 2001 db 8 So this is connected to the autonomous system 65501. If you pay attention to reach that address 2001 db 8 ff 20 the, the one that announces that prefix is 65501. 
2001 DB8 FF00. So that one has a prefix 2001 DB8 FF00 colon slash 40. So it's announcing a slash 40. So when 65.5.110 announces a slash 40, 65.5.02 turns this on and announces it to the 65.5.01. So 65.5.01 will have in its routing table 2.9.db.8.0.0 slash 40, and the AS path is 65.5.02 and 65.5.1.0. So that would be the normal case. Now, the client sends it to the default gateway. We assume that it's 65501, and that one will refer to 65502, and because they have the routing table, it will forward it to 65510. That's expected behavior. Now, what would occur if all of a sudden 65509 starts to announce 65501db8ff00 slash 48, that prefix, as we can see, is more specific than the previous one. It's a slash 48 instead of a slash 40. So normally, that prefix will have precedence over others. 65509 will announce it. And if 65502 does not have the measures uh, configured and uh, maybe has filters because has not contemplated this, will learn of uh, 65509, the uh, 201 uh, uh, db 8 ff uh, slash 48 and will put it in its routing table. And as it's more specific, it's the only uh, uh, path it sees, it will announce it. So now 65501 uh, will have two uh, entries into the in the routing table, one for the slash 40 that uh, already had from earlier, but now this red one, two, uh, 2001 uh, DB8 FFO uh, slash 48, and the path will be 65502, 65509. So when the client wants to reach the uh, address uh, 201 DB8 FFO slash 20, um, when uh, they want to reach that uh, uh, address, this is the path that uh, it will take, and this is what we call a route hijack. So what we are doing there, just by announcing that prefix that passes to the other autonomous systems, we can hijack the routes. Uh, we, instead of going where it should, the traffic will go to our autonomous system. So from then on, we can do different things with the traffic there that goes there from analyzing traffic. Uh, um, imagine that it's a bank uh, site. You could uh, keep the credentials and do a number of things with that. You can re-inject it and uh, the client may not even realize that uh, that has happened because you're n just uh, analyzing traffic and redirecting it. So a lot of different things that you can do. So this l is very simple. It's not uh, the hijacking is not uh, so complex because the B does not have mechanisms to tell who can announce that prefix and who cannot. So it's 65509 decides to announce it, and 65502 doesn't know whether it's right or not because it's a peer that uh, is announcing prefixes. They will accept it and announce it to others, and that is precisely what happens. So this is the most common case. Another case of routing uh, 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 accidents is the route to leaks. It's, it's different, uh, but uh, it's rather common too. What happens is that uh, normally would, uh, we have different relations, such as the interconnection of autonomous systems. We have different types of relations. We have transit. We have peerings. So usually you there are certain rules that you have to abide by for instance that the prefixes learned from an ip transit or a provider should not be announced to peerings and 
the opposite applies. What I learn from peering, I don't have to inform it to the transit operators. So what I learn because of, uh, through transit or peering, I do announce it uh, downstream uh, to clients, but not upstream. So the prefixes learned from a uh, provider should not be announced to another peering, and those applied to a, 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 a peering should not be announced to other peerings or other providers. So if we don't follow that rule, then you may have a route leaks, uh, leak. In this case, for instance, we have 65511, the autonomous system up there, that would be the transit provider for uh, 536 and 537. So both five, these la two latter ones have a peering, and each will announce their own routes. So 65536 announces both its uh, transit provider and the peering, their own route, uh, that is 201 DB8 10/40. And uh, 65537 announces the uh, 2001 DB8 20/40. Uh, now that's okay. Now the problem is that when uh, 65537 learns the route of uh, 536, if there are no configured filters, that will be a problem because he's, it's learned something that can be announced and then a leak takes place because. 65537 learns from uh, 2001 DB8 uh, uh, 10 of uh, 536, and if they re announce it in the internet, well, in this case, the uh, route, as it's the same prefix length, probably it won't uh, result in much trouble. But if it were more specific, then the traffic would start to flow through 65537. So not only is it a suboptimal path, but it will saturate the links. And once again, we have things that we absolutely don't want, is the, the traffic between two autonomous systems to go through a third one. So that's a problem. Usually, these uh, route uh, leaks uh, are uh, because they are not configured, and the, a lot of leaks. Uh, there are a lot of leaks. A complete uh, uh, internet uh, routing table gets filtered and goes uh, through places where it shouldn't, and that uh, results in bandwidth problems. Because I'm instead of announcing just one thing, I'm announcing the whole table, and I'm saturating the links, and etc. So that basically is the routing problems that we want to solve, that we need to have solutions for today. So here I have a chart of the manners uh, watch. This, these are the key security incidents. To your left, you have the global scenario, and to your right, uh, Lucknick. And you see that it's, uh, it says route misoriginations. Mis That's what we call the route hijacks. That's the most frequent. Now, what we see, the positive thing is that in the last year, this is from September 23 to September 24, we've seen a drop in uh, the overall incidents, but globally they were 1,000 and now uh, 500. Uh, and in Latin America, it also went down from 150 to a bit uh, under 100, more or less like 80. So why does it go down? Well, essentially because of the actions and because uh, uh, there's awareness among the providers and uh, they know the actions that need to be adopted to uh, uh, prevent uh, this from happening. So th this has been a, a significant step forward because in the past we used to have 5,000 incidents yearly. And you can see this in Manners uh, Observatory. That's where I took uh, this uh, these curves from. So what can we do to mitigate such incidents? Well, now I'm going to give the floor to Erika, who will tell us 
how we can start solving these problems. Hola. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. So let's go on with this part. Uh, I'm going to expand on what Guillermo said earlier about uh, these incidents. Well, the most common incidents that we have, many of them that are presented uh, in the routing, if, uh, con related to routing, are not uh, uh, n not because uh, uh, people are willing to do it, but it's just uh, a mistake. So. When we have these incidents, we need to be aware that every time we misconfigure things, or if we, we maybe do it more or less aware of it, these are configurations that will have an impact on all the peers we connect with. Remember that the internet is a network that is connected globally, and all the information that we generate from our infrastructure will affect other networks with whom we are connected. And to the extent that we have more connections in our infrastructure in our network, we also generate more data on the networks that we have outside, and they will also receive the data, and we will have a negative impact if we transmit all the, the data. So there are different mechanisms, and we are going to focus on that on today's tutorial to provide that uh, security at the level of BGP so that you may be aware of the mechanisms we have, or if somehow we can see whether we are configuring things wrong or if we are receiving something that we shouldn't from the rest of the peers. There's a global uh, framework that is uh, manners, or those are the standards that have uh, been agreed upon for the routing rules. And it, they started disseminating it with the support and under the leadership of the Internet Society. What this framework intends to do is to provide solutions, key uh, crucial solutions, that will enable us to reduce routing threats, the most common threats, uh, including these that Guillermo was showing uh, in the charts, route uh, hijack, uh, our, the, uh, our, and uh, the uh, our fake um, addresses. And so here, we will focus on uh, some actions that need to be uh, taken, first of all, to raise awareness. So we, we can uh, gradually identify what the threats are, what the incidents may cause as we have misconfigurations in our infrastructure and the potential harm on the other networks connected. It will promote an accountability culture among the people that uh, m manage the networks we need to be aware of what a collective accountability is, because that's the way the Internet works. Each of us must be aware of what we should do when we uh, um, become responsible for that, uh, interconnecting with other external networks. We need to know um, what are the actions that we can adopt uh, to reduce the threats when uh, or whenever they appear, and to provide this framework at a global level, because it's a, it's a global framework where we are going to know the specific actions f that are not uh, focused on uh, the procurement of, the, uh, of input or uh, hardware or, or infrastructure, but these are actions that we can implement with some logical configurations uh, when we do the routing in layer three. So much of this, much of what we're going to tell you about today, these f four hours in this tutorial, it's all going to be focused on the actions uh, within manner or the mutually agreed standards for uh, routing security. So this 
program will focus on providing solutions to three classes of problems. One of them is uh, the incorrect routing data. As teacher showed you, in the two cases of uh, route uh, leaks, uh, route hijacks, it's information that we may be publishing to other networks, either because of misconfiguration or maybe with a uh, uh, bad intent. So. Um, we, uh, then we need to know what we should not publish uh, about uh, the IP traffic uh, with a uh, 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 false uh, IP that when they don't have the right to publish a resource that doesn't belong to them or using an IP of uh, some service that uh, is public in the internet and is operating and relating through coordination and collab collaboration between the parties, that is the network operators, because we are in charge of those configurations in the infrastructure and it's up to us to do something when we have such incidents. This MANAS program has grown, and the first one that was developed for these mutually agreed norms are for network or for network operators. So this program includes all the network operators groups and other work, internet service providers, end users, other entities, academic networks. So quite a large group. You have the program for traffic exchange points. This program already has specific actions for these traffic exchange points in each country. Then the program for network uh, distribution, CDNs, and cloud providers, as well as those that provide services provided for in the sense of routing for the clients as well as the manners for vendors of routing equipment globally. Our tutorial will focus on the first program, which is the manners for network operators. This includes four actions. These actions are included in this program. Each one has its own specific actions that have to be followed depending on the role Played in the internet, this program includes four actions filtering, anti spoofing, coordination, and global validation. In filtering, well, and for each of these actions, we can also measure how we are applying and complying with each of these actions in our infrastructure. Throughout the tutorial, we'll be learning how to measure in your own infrastructure, the percentage of compliance regarding these actions. But we'll be now focusing on global validation. That is where we will see the mechanisms that operate for this purpose. In the case of filtering, at the edge of the network, we always put place filters. The most common ones are those, the filters for those routes that are we know globally namely all those address segments used for testing purposes, this private IP addressing segments, then we start adding more specific filters depending on what we wish to announce and what we wish to receive. In the case of anti-spoofing, this is more based on understanding which are the points of the infrastructure that we have to configure in order to eliminate generating in our network any type of announcement with any f uh, fake uh, addresses. And this will be blocked within our network. So we have to see where in our network we have to do this configuration, which is quite similar to filtering. In the case of coordination, this is focused on developing the joint work between network operators. The actions that we have to take, for example, having updated information in our website, the contact information for our network operation centers, our NOGs, what other type of information should be updated. This would be public information. And this has to do with 
databases such as WHOIS, Peering, DB. So we have to see how we can keep those updated. So whenever there is an incident, you can contact us very rapidly and take rapid action to respond to an incident that is taking place so as to mitigate any issues regarding misconfigurations. And then we have global, global validation, which is to understand those actions that will help us publish data on training so that other networks can validate that our information is correct. In addition to that, how we can do that validation regarding what we receive from other peers in order to see if we can allow them to go through our infrastructure or not, if these are secure or not, as well as the mechanisms that will allow us to do that validation globally in the case of these interconnections. So back to you, Chicho. Thank you, Erika. As Erika was saying, this last part that she was referring to regarding global validation is based related to providing information to other autonomous systems so that the other autonomous systems can determine what is the information, which is the routing information, what prefixes, and what are things that we will be accepting from others. So this is a key part of why we introduce these things like RPKI or IRR, how to have information beyond our autonomous system. because. What normally happens is, let us assume you have a peer relationship between 65501 and 65502. These are two autonomous systems that will start to configure a BGP and will start to exchange routing information. 65501, for example, let us assume that you manage that autonomous system, 65501 you know what you should be announcing to other autonomous systems because you are the ones who manage that network. So you manage 65501. You know what are the prefixes that you have to announce. You know what, who your customers are. You know which are the other networks that are connected to who you wish to provide transit to. So what normally happens is if I manage 6551, I can configure filters by filters, by communities, by AS path or whatever. But I will be able to determine, to announce these are the networks, these are the autonomous systems, only those. I will be announcing these. And what do I affect? I affect the incoming traffic. So I announce a set of networks through BGP, which are the networks that I have behind my autonomous system. And that is something that is we know. What about when 65501, I, we just don't want anyone announcing us because that is what happens in the first slides that I referred to regarding route hijacking. If 65502 we announce in something that I don't want and I then accept it, I will have a problem. Now, how can I know what is behind 65502? So first of all, how do I know first what are the routes that 65502 has, which are the prefixes that 65502 has and wishes to announce? How can I determine that? And beyond that, if 65502 provides traffic to other organizations, what are the autonomous systems? What prefixes do they have? So how do I determine this? There is no way of determining this in BGP by BGP mechanisms. The way you can determine this involves using other databases, and that is why you have these issues such as RPKIs or the Internet Routing Registers, IRR. So when I wish to know what another autonomous system should be announcing, I cannot determine this when I pick up a peering. So when I configure BGP, the other autonomous system will start to publish a whole set of announcements. But I don't know whether that is correct or not. I cannot know this just through BGP. So for those situations, we have to 
what we could call databases. These are the IRRs, the Internet Routing Registries, or RPKI, Resource Public Key Infrastructure. The Internet Routing Registries, IRRs, are databases where the organizations publish their routing policies. RPKI is a more recent technology, much more recent than IRR. And these are published by the organizations. These are used by the organizations to publish their information. So I want you to keep this in mind if you haven't learned about this previously. This is the most basic way of thinking about it. I need external assistance to verify the BGP announcements against something because I cannot do BGP on its own. I can accept or not accept things, but I don't have a criteria to follow. So how do I do? I have I can do queries to external databases, and I then will see how those queries are carried out and how can I, I can configure the filters. But that is a concept. I can check what I receive against an IRR or against the database of RPKI. Then I get to, can determine whether what is being announced is correct or not. The Internet Routing Registries, as I was saying, is something that has been around for quite some time. This began to be used back in the 90s. This is a problem we have known for quite a long time now. So the Internet Routing Registries have been around for quite a number of years. These, uh, On the right, you have the list of the IRRs. LACNIC has its own Internet Routing Registry. And these are used so that the autonomous systems in the organizations can define which other routes they're going to publish as well as other options. But basically, one today uses this for the following. Each autonomous system publishes in the IRR the networks that they're going to announce. And at the same time, they can also publish the sets of the autonomous systems, the ASs, that define which are these sets of autonomous systems that will be published, as I said. So why is this used? The operators, other operators, use this information. So they know that autonomous system 65501 will, says it will publish these networks in the internet. So I know that if another network comes, it won't be right because it's not what was announced by 65501. So with this aim, I can generate filters. We often use automatic systems to generate filters for the routers in an automatic way using the information of an IRR. This is an example of an IRR register. They have this format. The one at the top is a uh, Route 6. In other words, this is an object describing a route, an IPv6 route. So you can see here you have Route 6. First, you have the prefix 28039910 colon 8000 slash 34, that prefix. And you have a whole set of information afterwards, but you have to know what the origin is, and it's AS64135. Then those two values, the prefix and the origin, is the important part here. So if this prefix is published as 64135, it's correct. Otherwise, it's not correct. So this is the verification that allows you to do this in if an update I receive from BGP in a BGP response to this or not. So this is just an example. Below you have a description of an autonomous system. There are several fields, but the main point is precisely this, the prefix and the origin autonomous system. 
On the other hand, we have RPKI. As I had explained, there are two mechanisms. One is the RIR, which is older, and RPKI, which is more recent. RPKI is more solid, more sound from the point of view of security because it defines a publicly infrastructure that is specially designed to be applied to routing, particularly to BGP. So when LACNIC or when a regional registry gives resources, gives IP4 and IPv6 addresses or autonomous systems to the organizations, to its members, in addition to giving them the IPs, they can also give a digital certificate for that, are, that is associated to the addresses. So the uh, receiving organizations of those addresses will also have this digital certificate and a verifiable proof of the ownership. What can you do with a digital certificate? You can sign objects. So all this is all this can be validated from the cryptographic standpoint. So by issuing these digital certificates, I'm adding an extra security layer because I can later on check that if there's an object that was signed with a certain certificate, well, I can go back in the chain and uh, verify if that was done by the appropriate uh, organization or if it's the one that has the certificate associated to those prefixes. So, once we have uh, that uh, RPKI of resources, what we have in RPKI, basically, if you are operators, what uh, you are most interested in is not so much cryptography and how it works, but to just keep what you need to know of RPKI. AI that can be used uh, for these routing problems. So there you'll have two things. On the one hand, you have the ROAs that are the objects that we said that can be digitally signed. As you have the RPKI, these objects that are similar to what we saw in the RIR now can be signed digitally. And who will be able to sign them? Only the organization that had the resources, that has the resources. So the ROAs are equivalent to uh, the Route uh, uh, 6 uh, that uh, basically define uh, the autonomous system of origin for a prefix is what we just saw that uh, the, you saw the prefix and uh, the autonomous system of origin. Well, in the case of ROAs, it's the same. The set uh, of prefixes and uh, the uh, uh, autonomous system of origin. That's what we want to define. And the big difference in this case is that they are signed with uh, the uh, certificate private key. That is that only those that have the certificate uh, awarded by the registry will be able to sign uh, those uh, objects. So that adds an additional uh, security layer. And all these ROAs that we create, all the organizations that uh, get connected should create their own ROAs, and that organization is left uh, in a repository technique. It's a public and uh, anybody can download it. So it's a public database that you can download. The other part that uh, provides RPKI is a prefix validation mechanism, the so-called validation of origin. The R in the RIRs, that was not so clearly speci specified, although uh, the RIRs use certain tools, they don't have a standard for that purpose. But in the case of RPKI, we have the validation of origin. So the most important thing so far is understanding how to create the ROAs, what they are, and uh, then we're going to see how the validation of origin works. So, but before uh, going to another topic, uh, let me tell you a couple of things. There are two ways RPKI works. It's the hosted and the delegated modes. In the hosted mode, 
all the op cryptographic operations are l left in the uh, LACNIC or the registry, and in the delegated mode, you have the capacity to sign your own uh, registries as a certifying authority. What we have uh, in uh, the resource PKI, the, we, we have uh, it in the National Registry of LACNIC, and with that, LACNIC signs the certificates that will then deliver to the other organizations. Now, in turn, some organizations would be able or might decide to delegate that capacity of signing to other organizations. In this case, for example, the in this case, for instance, to my right, a fine organization receives a certificate and the resources assigned by LACNIC. And to your, the one on the left, the organization might receive the ability to sign for other organizations and delegate it. Um, usually, most organizations uh, that work with LACNOC use the hosted mode. That all the maintenance of the uh, PK, uh, RPKI infrastructure is based on the registry, and you act through MILACNIC, our portal. And all the uh, cryptography, the ro rollovers, and uh, the ROAs, all that is uh, handed, uh, handled by the system uh, automatically. And the user. Uh, the only thing that the user needs to do is to keep the ROAs. There are large organizations that uh, may work with uh, different uh, regional registries with different regions. So they might need to use the delegated mode. They may have their own uh, certifying authority, the CA, that will depend on uh, the regional registry, and they will call the uh, up-down uh, protocol to act uh, with uh, the uh, that will exchange the information in the protocol. So in the case of Brazil, for instance, this is the model that they use. Eh, bueno, hasta acá, ¿qué vimos? Y acá. Uh, so here, what have we seen so far? Well, let's uh, give you an overview of uh, what we just saw. The first thing that we saw was uh, the uh, key routing incidents that are the route uh, hijacks and the leaks. Then Erica talked about, yes, the best practices, focusing on those four actions that you need to follow as network operators, being aware that the, uh, out of those four actions, we are going to focus on the global validation part. What are the mechanisms that we should use to do the validation of the data that we receive from the external networks, not actions that we can apply netly for our own infrastructure to validate the behavior of our infrastructure or filter data that we will send to our close peers, but validation of the routes that we originate and the mechanisms that we will use to publish that information so other external networks may validate whether they are secure networks or not. So here we start seeing the mechanisms uh, that we can use to get information from the autonomous system, the external networks that the teacher mentioned, the internet routing registries and the IRRs and uh, the RPKIs, which we're going to develop further as we move along. Teacher now told you about the general part, what are each of these mechanisms and what is the information that it provides us that um, and now we're going to see how each operates and how we can use these mechanisms and uh, to visualize or apply information for the configuration that we use uh, in our infrastructure. We will explain this as we move along uh, using some demos. Uh, 
as if we were configuring uh, a machine. What is uh, the configuration that we see, for instance, of a, an internet routing registry? What is the information that they have? What are the routes that are published and how they are being segmented and how we can use that information? And the same applies to the RPKI. If we start validating things, Chito explained the two models, the two modes, um, how you can use uh, this uh, validation of origin use using either the delegated or hosted mode. The hosted mode is the most popular. If we own um, IPv4 addressing and IPv6 uh, re addressing resources, we have an autonomous number or we only have uh, addressing. Uh, the, the, the mode that we use the most is the hosted mode, that is using LACNIC system for the validation. and we just uh, generate the cryptographic certificates, the ROAs that men Chicho mentioned. These certificates, we are delivering information for the system to be fed and so that the data can be shown at a global level to qualify the routes that we publish, indicating whether it's a valid route, invalid, or not found. This is something that we will discuss later on. Now, for those of you who are connected via Zoom, please remember that we are ready to help you. If you want to ask any questions, you can do so in the Q&A. Uh, panel, you can write that down and we will answer as we go. And you, in person, you can uh, approach the microphones and uh, there you can ask any questions and we'll clarify it. The, the idea is that in uh, the tutorial we are going to go through things more than once and uh, please Take advantage of this. Remember that it's a four-hour tutorial and we can clarify any um, issues that were not explained too clearly. Now we are checking two mechanisms and it is there that we are going to use the demo part and then we are going to focus on better understanding the mechanism, the RPKI, that is, well, let's say it has uh, are more characteristics that you need to understand. For instance, if you want to have a validation infrastructure, um, oh, so let's see if there's anything else. I may explain this if you wish. Bueno. So let's see how we can use the uh, information with uh, an example. Let's imagine that we have a peering example with two autonomous system, 65, 501, and 502, and uh, the appropriate prefixes, uh, DB820 slash 48, and then uh, 2030, 113, slash 24, and in 50 to it's a slash 24 uh, two. there you have it so in this case if these autonomous systems published their data in an RIR how could I uh, consult one basic thing is to send a query using the who is uh, command I could uh, send a query to LACNIC uh, RRR and with that send taxes there ask you can ask for the IPv6 prefixes that have 65502 that autonomous system notice that it's in that very simple way you can draw the list of prefixes that uh, 65502 says it's going to publish as their autonomous system of origin now where do i get that information from from uh, what uh, 65502 published in rir remember that we we keep saying this uh, this the these databases uh, are good so that each autonomous system may declare what they want to publish in the internet with their autonomous system. So the others will be able to consult the RIR and uh, uh, take that uh, list as a, uh, um, and so 
all we have all the IPv6 and, and IPv4 filters, and we configure them in uh, the ROA. So this would be the manual way. This syntaxes, how to put the exclamation mark, and uh, all that you can uh, find it in that link where we have it explained. What happens with a more elaborated case. Not only do we have two autonomous systems, but we have an autonomous system, a 65502, that wants to give transit to some of the clients. So when they do peering with between 65501 and 65502, 65502 wants uh, 502 wants to announce uh, the prefixes of uh, their uh, connected, uh, and that's valid too. So it gives transit to three autonomous systems. Now, how can they tell 65501 that they want to announce that? So you can create an object in IRI, which is called AS set. This is a set of autonomous systems. In other words, describing what are the autonomous systems I have in that AS set. That AS set, for example, has this name, AS Transito. So 65501 will be able to see which are the autonomous systems to which 65502 wishes to provide transit. So what 502 does is to list the autonomous systems to which it wishes to provide transit. So once that AS set is registered, the other autonomous systems can check what is the set of autonomous systems it's going to provide transit to. So 65509, 65510, 65511, and the other autonomous systems will check the prefixes not only for 502, but all the other three, because they are listed there. You can take the IP4 and IPv6 prefix 6. You can do this for each of the autonomous systems established in the AS set. So that gives you the full list of prefixes that we should be filtering or should allow from 65502. How do we create the AS sets in Milaknik? There is you enable using the IRR. Once you do so, LACNIC's IRR has a specificity that's not always manual, but in the majority, this is automatic, and it's taken from RPKI information. But it does have this AS set part that you can create in MILACNIC, and this is done manually. So there, you describe the name of the AS set, and in the second line, you have ASN members. So there, you enter the members that the S set will have. This is used very much, particularly by some of the CDNs that today ask you to create the AS set where you include the members or the organizations and the autonomous systems to which you will be providing transit. Once created, it looks like this. This is for LACNOG. This is an arbitrary name. For example, these are the AS sets that in this afternoon's lab you will be able to see. This includes some of the autonomous si systems. And it's an AS set that was created by LACNOG. The members are. Autonomous systems 28,000, 28,001, 12, 6, 5, 4, and 19, 6, 1, 5. And the other is another AS set that is used for the laboratory where you have other autonomous systems there that are included. So this is what it is about, basically, namely creating the AS set. Now let us see how this works. How is this used? So once we have created the AS set, what we're going to be able to do is to do a query. And for each of the autonomous systems listed there, we'll have to expand this and 
get the IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes. There is a tool that makes this job easier, which is BGP Q4. When you do a query for the IRR, you put the IRR you're doing, conducting the query for, for example, LACNIC in this case. Then you write an access list and the AS set, which is what you have in bold type. So this will generate the access list directly. It will do what I have just explained. It will do the query to each of the autonomous systems. It will check the networks and automatically this creates a prefix list in the first case for IPv4 and in the second case for IPv6. But this is generating the list that you can apply when configuring your router. You then include this in the BGP prefix list, and the incoming filter is already set up. So if I'm going to connect using the autonomous system 65502, I set this up, and then I automatically have the list created to apply to my configuration of the BGP. This Cisco command has different formats, Juniper, Microtik, and others. So basically, this is the manual way to do so, but this afternoon we'll be seeing how you can automate all the process. But this already provides a lot of information. So in, initially, we said, what do I know what is behind 65502? Well, now I do know what I have. 65502 is telling me in the AS set. And with this tool, I can extract this. This is a variant. Instead of a prefix list, I have an AS path. This is a slightly different command. I have the AS set that I have here with the members in bold type, the ones we saw just now, AS28000 and so on from LACNOG. And with this, with this syntax I have over here, I enter the list of autonomous systems. And this will generate a filter by AS path, which is that expression down there. So what begins with 65,000 and then anything, and this should end with the origin autonomous system, which are the four that we have here, which are the AS set members. So this will allow any AS path that ends in these four autonomous systems. So let us make a brief demo of this, and after that, we're going to see the origin validation part. So let us first have a demo. This demo. Here in this demo, you have to help us with the information. We're going to be showing you the following. We're going to do a demo of the IRR part. And like Chicho was explaining, we will see how we can conduct these queries of what we publish in the IRR. So if anyone here in the room or anyone who is connected remotely wishes so, you can give, you, give us your autonomous system name if you have already created an object or an object in IRR. In the IRR, in these databases of the IRR, we have the two objects we see most frequently, which are the route and route 6 objects. The route 6 objects are the two IP4 ones that we see and that we publish in our routes and the Route 6, in the IPv6 systems that we publish. So if anyone wishes to come up to the microphone and give us the name of your autonomous system so we can validate this, 
So we can explain how this query is done. So that the participants connected remotely can give us their information through the chat. So if you're not sure whether these objects were created, please let us know if you can create the autonomous systems on that. So that we can create the IRR. So this is the who is to the IRR LACNIC. What I'm showing here is when I'm looking for an object, which is the maintainer, this includes all the objects created by this maintainer. So it's going to show me all the objects created here. So these are the route and route 6 created, created by LACNOG. In this case, you can see it over here, 2803-9910 slash 32. We only have route 6 here. This is 9910 slash 33, which is more specific, 9910-8000 slash 34. This is 99C000 slash 34. We have an autonomous system that was sent to us through Zoom. Gino you know, Espejo sent us the autonomous system 6568. Six, five, six, eight. So this is an autonomous system from an IP in Bolivia. So we're going to do the same query we did just now for this, but now using the maintainer, we're going to change this. And here, We have a whole set of objects. So this is the query I just did. The objects over here have a slash 22 with the origin autonomous system 168. A slash 17 with autonomous system 6568. A slash 16. A slash 29 another slash 16, a slash 32 in IPv6, and then we have the autonomous system. And here we have the AS set. Here you have the AS set clients that contains all these autonomous systems. AS peers, these are probably the autonomous systems which they do peering, or the autonomous systems to which they wish to provide transit with our peers, the AS providers. And that would be it. So let us see if we can expand this one over here. This is AS peers. Using BGPQ4. So you will realize that, in principle, we didn't have absolute no information at all. Hi, good morning. Name, organization. I'm from Axis Bolivia, the autonomous system 65 to 2010. 65, 26 to 10. It's over here. We're going to do the query, and we'll check 26 to 1, 0. So we only have the information of the autonomous system of a network. We don't have any other information at all regarding the segments per published by that autonomous system or that other autonomous systems have to provide transit. So with this mechanism, we know we can use this database globally. So we having information on the autonomous system, we can do these queries and then start to visualize. You'll see with this exercise now, 
with the one Genoveva shared with us, we'll have all the IP4 and IPv6 six months that are published with this autonomous system as an origin, as well as the autonomous system to which they are providing transit with all the members we can see here in the AS sets that were created. So when we receive information or when we have some time a connection with that autonomous system, we conduct the query and can visualize the information that can be used to see how we apply these filters for that connection. I use the command bgpq4. The command bgpq4 was used. So I did a query to the AS set. We remember this one was the one that was created already. So I create a prefix list, and then this is included in the Cisco format. With the prefix, it expands the AS set, and for each of the autonomous systems, I can obtain the IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes. This BGP4, BGPQ4 command, as I was saying, is the one you can use. You can use other output formats. For instance, if I put minus J, it will give me Juniper minus uh, K7 Micritic. And if here I put minus J, it puts it in a Juniper format already. And if I put minus K7, it will give me the, you put the Microtech format. So again, what you're doing with this, <coughs> you're going to connect with the autonomous system. You know what the, I said that the autonomous system has, because usually what the other organization does is uh, to uh, publish that. You take that and uh, you apply these rules directly in your router. So if you do that, you have a way you can get the, infor the information that the, and the, the other autonomous system tells you what they're going to publish. 26,210, that's the next. From Bolivia, we have a question. If it's B26 uh, to 10, is that right? Yes, it's right. It's a Bolivian company. In the case of 2010, uh, we're not seeing anything. Probably they don't have any objects in RAR. Remember that now, with this mechanism that uh, we are showing, the RAR, if we have resources that uh, LACNIC has assigned, the way we create these objects in the RAR is by using the MILACNIC system. This uh, is what LACNIC uh, delivers us to uh, manage the resources. We enter LACNIC, and to your left, you see the services and RAR, and there you can choose to pick uh, RAR, and you have the option of creating the road and road s route 6. And there we have to um, uh, say what are the IPv4 resources that you are using. In this case, it would be 26202. And uh, the IPv6 uh, r r um, the prefixes that we're publishing, when we create this through the Midlachnik system, that is uh, the information that will be sent to update the global RAR 
RI, our databases, and so we'll see them in the queries. So there we saw two cases that were quite good for our exercise, the case of the autonomous system that Genoveva sent us, where we could see several uh, route and route six and AS6 uh, uh, objects created indicating members for autonomous systems that it gives transit to, and in the case of this autonomous system, that uh, well, They'll do the task to enter the Milaknik uh, system and create the objects. Now, I want to remind you that, uh, well, this morning we are going to, uh, in theory, we are going to check these mechanisms in detail, while in the afternoon we will have the hands on lab. It's going to be in this same room. And uh, the hands on uh, lab of routing uh, secure and validation of origin. We're going to have three uh, instructors, Santiago, Silvia, Chavez, and Nicolas Antonello. And there we will see you will have an access to virtual machines where you're going to be able to uh, configure things and see how these mechanisms work. As a matter of fact, you'll even be able to uh, simulate an attack and its mitigation. So all that will be mitigated with uh, the lab that we're going to have in the afternoon. Another important thing is on Thursday, well, we are going to be, through, during the event, we're going to be around, just in case you want to uh, explain any details of what we are explaining in this tutorial. But on Thursday, specifically, we're going to have a session that is for queries, or you may ask questions. It's going to be at 4 p.m. after the break, after the second break. And in that uh, session during the week, you can write down the, any questions that you may have at the Malachnik system and uh, conducting queries with the mechanisms that we are giving you today, mechanisms so that you can validate your prefix uh, publication, if you're publishing uh, your info in uh, these databases, if you've created your ROIAs or objects in your RIR. So please come to that uh, meeting at 4 on Thursday to ask any questions. And not just questions, but you may tell us of uh, your cases if you've already implemented the validation of origin. That's what we're going to see now. Or if you have had any problems creating the objects of uh, or the um, So could you reset? Uh, so at 11, we'll have a break. So the last thing I did there was to answer a question about the Lucknow autonomous system. And remember that there we had seen all uh, the objects of Lacanag with these three prefixes. And so here we could have this filter. And if I connect with Lacanag, I know what are the networks that Lacanag will announce that are these three. What will the filter do? Well, it won't let anybody in if not announced. So there I'm avoiding the hijacking. So you see, it's not so complex. It's once, once you know the tools, you use them, and you may start applying them, and you can do that manually or automatically. Now, we are going to follow with the presentation. And there. Well, here I leave the references of what we've seen, the RIR, the, some articles on how to uh, do peering and uh, RIR, the BG, BGPQ4 tool, and uh, Milaknik if you want to create uh, the objects. Now I'm going to give the floor to Eric, and she will tell you about the validation of origin with RPKI. <laughs> So, 
Um, um, we closed the first mechanism, that is the RIR part, and here we are going to focus on how to use uh, the other mechanism that is a b bit more complex. It gives us more tools and information to do the validation of the routes. So it's the validation of origin. It's all linked to that action for the global validation that we have in the manners program. So here, what we are going to see is what does a validation infrastructure contain? Well, remember that we had already talked of uh, the two modes you can use for the validation, delegated and hosted modes. So here, I'm going to explain the in the, um, whatever the mode you're using, what are the components that uh, uh, are at stake to provide the information if you use RPKI. So we have, we're going to have, we have a router, our border uh, a, a machine where we learn all the routes of the connections we have. We have our router tables at BGP. When we activate BGP, we know all uh, the routes with the connections that we have activated with our peers. In that router, too, we are going to have all the information that we configure to publish all the uh, internal information in our network. Um, so we are going to have uh, uh, a cache uh, link to this in case we want to start validating our infrastructure and, and that makes sense, for instance, when we use or we publish information of several autonomous systems. So if we are an internet service provider, it's good for us to have a validation infrastructure so that we can start obtaining information of the validity status of the, each route that we receive in our BGP routing table. Here we are going to have locally something that we call validating catchy, that it's a software that we'll install in a regular server, and that validating uh, uh, catchy is going, going to be synchronizing with uh, the repositories, global repositories of the regional internet registries. In this case, we have, and in that repository, you have the information of all the global internet registries, ARIN, AFRINIC, RIPE, and API APINIC. She's missing, she's, um, and, uh, no, uh, and LACNIC, of course. Of the five internet uh, uh, registries, what is the repository that, uh, uh, what is the information that they will have? They will have the uh, cryptographic certificates that we generate. So that repository will have the, the information of all the ROAs that have been generated, of the resources assigned globally. And there we will see. We see all of the ROAs, and the validating cache will bring that information locally to uh, our infrastructure and will update. When the validating cache brings that information locally, they, it can disclose it to the various routers that uh, we have that have act the, uh, an activated BGP or external connections, the router will be consulting that information to the validating cache, and we're going to start to see a new attribute in the BGP. That new attribute will deliver a status to a state to each of the routes, and in the large routing table, we'll see whether the routes that we see there are valid, invalid, or not found. Later on, I'm going to explain what that is about. What is the information that is considered to qualify the state of the route? The routers will be requesting that information to, uh, they will be demanding the catches, the connection with a cache, with a validating cache, and between the different routers, 
we're going to be using the RTR uh, protocol, and it is there that we will see this new attribute in our BGP table. There, we are already visualizing something that you typically don't have in the normal BGP, and that is having the validity state of all the routes there. And that can only be done through activating this RPKI mechanism in our infrastructure. I don't know whether you have any questions so far. In Zoom, if you have any questions, please remember that you can write your questions in the Q&A panel. All right, so once the routers receive the uh, data of the validating cache of the software that we have there, remember that the validating cache is the one that connects with the repositories. and brings all the information of the ROAs, of the certificates that were generated, and will be able to visualize, to bring uh, the data. You'll have a table where we're going to have the information of the prefix. If you have a complete prefix that is being delivered or if it's being disaggregated, if it's summarized, here we give you an example of an IPv4 free prefix. Uh, there you have it's 200 1120. This is a slash 22, but it's being disaggregated into 24 slashes, and the autonomous system is uh, being published. It's 65501. So there, by using the messages that we have in BGP that are the update messages. We are going to start receiving the validation through the update messages. We will see that information of our validating cache. When it receives that information of the prefix that you have, de manera sumarizada, if you receive this prefix, which is summarized or disaggregated, and the AS will then deliver that validity status to each of the routes we have in the routing table. We have the three validity statuses, which are valid, invalid, and not found. The valid status specifically is appears each time you receive information from that network. It will be validating that this coincides with the maximum length. We, in fact, are saying that this is not only broken down into 24 prefixes, and if it's a different breakdown of the prefixes, it will identify that something is wrong. And it will also validate that this continues to be published, and whenever we receive information on that route, this is received with the origin AS. 65501. So there we can see the case that Chicho was explaining about how route hijacking when we began the tutorial. So another autonomous system comes and starts to publish a prefix, and the AS path then changed. Now, with this information, it will see that something is wrong in the autonomous system if there was a change in the autonomous system of origin and then identified as an invalid route. So in order to determine whether this is a valid route, we will see that, in fact, it coincides with the origin AS and the maximum length of that breakdown into the prefixes. So. This is broken down by 24, slash 24 prefixes, but otherwise it would be 22. The length would be 22. In the case of invalid prefixes, is when the information on that ROA or that graphic certificate does not coincide with these two principles, the origin AS and how disaggregation takes place. And then we have not found, which is one of the ones we find most. This not found status come, appears when from these segments we didn't generate any certificates, we, when we didn't generate the ROAs. This doesn't mean that it's invalid or something we have to filter, but in fact it means that it doesn't have its ROA. It hasn't been generated. So we have the three options for validity status. When we visualize that information in the routing table, we can then take action 
The most basic one will be to start filtering those networks that we are receiving with invalid status or not valid status. As we saw, we see the part that contains the RPKI infrastructure. Now, let us look at the details as to how we generate these ROAs, these certificates. These are digital certificates that are encrypted. In the IRR, we had the route and route six objects. If we compare this with the IRR, we could say that the ROA could be equivalent to one of these objects, a route or route six. And these are the ones who will be, to which we'll be associating an IPv4, IPv6 prefix to an AS, an origin AS, to deliver BGP information in order to proceed to checking. Now, who generates these ROAs? All the entities, all the service providers, all the network operators that have IP resources. So you have been assigned the IPv4 and IPv6 resources, and therefore you should generate your ROAs, regardless of whether you have an autonomous system number or not. Because in if we have IPv4 or IPv6 addressing assigned to us, and if we don't have an autonomous system assigned to us, that publication of prefixes should be done. Through what system? We use this using what? Anyone? Can anyone tell me? Nobody. Everyone's so quiet. Is everyone, is everyone asleep? So we use our internet service provider or our upstream provider. So when we don't have an autonomous system assigned to us, we deliver our IPv4 addressing and IPv6 addressing in order to publish what we wish to publish to the internet. So what they do is to put their autonomous system as an origin and publish the prefixes we deliver. So regardless of whether we have an autonomous system or not, we have to create these ROAs. Now, to create these certificates for the ROAs is also done in the Milaknik system. This is a system we have to manage the resources provided by LACNIC to the Latin America and Caribbean region. With that aim to create these, we need to have the access information to access the MILACNIC system. We recall that the MILACNIC system doesn't have different users. We have to have the technical user, which will be the one that will be able to access these IRR services and RPKI services to make changes. There are other users, which are the administrative users who receive the invoicing part, so we access with that user. We won't be able to visualize this in the MILACNIC system. So you have need different credentials. Prior to that, when the there were entities that didn't have their own resources, for example, there are a whole set of end entities that don't have their own resources. They haven't yet obtained their IP4 and IP6 addresses directly through Milaknik, but publishing the internet through a segment provided to them by the ISP. So they depended on that internet service provider that gave them that IP4 and IP6 segment would create these ROAs, these certificates. So this was involving certain problems because if, nevertheless, if we were customers and we s made this request, it could take some time until these certificates or ROAs were created. So following a policy that was approved in 2023, you will recall that here we have the policy development process. This is an open process where we define the assignment of policy for the region. So this public policy forum will be on Wednesday. So based on a proposal 
submitted in a proposal in 2023. All the users, when we receive IP4, IP6 addresses that have been sub-assigned to us by an internet service provider, then we will be able to create our rowers from the milac NIC system. So we'll be able to manage these sub-assigned resources and create these certificates. So as I was saying, we can have organizations that don't have their own autonomous systems, just IP4 and IPv6 addresses. So in that case, they have to create the ROEs, but you must bear in mind which is the autonomous system used for publishing this information. So you have to know the autonomous system or systems used for publishing our networks. Very often, we not only have uh, with an ISP, but we also have several ISPs as backers. We have to know which their autonomous system is in order to create these certificates and create and state that I'm publishing this IPv4 system published through this origin ISP. Any questions so far? So let us remember that the two principles that we have to bear in mind to create the rowers, are which, let's see, who can let us know? Otherwise, I think I'm speaking just to no one at all. So which are the two principles we have to bear in mind to generate these certificates? Anyone, anyone from the Zoom, anyone in the room? Anyone? Whoever answers will get a prize. No one? Really? So the two things that we have to take into account when creating rowers are the autonomous system used for publishing a route and how we are publishing it in a summarized way or broken down. So these are the two principles we have to bear in mind. So. With this example, this is an IPv4 address to 03.0.112.0 slash 22. So that is my network assigned to me by LACNIC. I have this IPv4 address. And how am I publishing this? Am I publishing it to all my connections with the upstream providers, with the ISPs? or with my transit providers in a summarized way? That, or did I break this down because I am using slash 24 networks to publish other services and segmented? So if I am breaking this down I, or disaggregated way, I have to generate the ROA. So with what autonomous system is this generated? If it's always the same origin ASN, like the example I mentioned, if we have different providers, if we are an entity and I have different ISPs, these providers have each their autonomous system. So if they are publishing their networks th through different ISPs, I have to generate these rowers, these certificates for each of the different autonomous systems with which these are being originated. Now, if we don't do that, and at some moment we generate a rower for one of the internet service providers, mentioning the origin AS and the other service provider is announcing our prefixes with their autonomous system, what we will do that in that case is to invalidate our route because when we Invalidate. We generate the row. We generate this information in the network where this information is being generated. So they will be seeing our network. But when they see this announced by another origin ISPs, they will see this or mark this as an invalid announcement. So the only thing that we have to respect is that policy to be clear as to what is the autonomous system we're using to publish our network and how we are doing so in what way we're making this, uh, are we publishing this. So where can we create our rowers? I have already mentioned. Can we zoom in? 
here on the screen, we see the Milaknik system, as I was saying. This shows you the example from the Laknog part. Laknik gave Laknog, the network operators community of the region, an IPv6 segment. We have access to that system to manage that resource. So when we access the Milaknik system, we enter the part on services, and you will note that this has a list of what we can do to manage this resource. We already did the IRR part where we created the objects for the IP4 and IPv6 objects that we published, and then we have the RPKI part. So when we click on RPKI, this will ask us the prefix, which is the prefix I received, and if I'm breaking this down, if I'm publishing this prefix, and I have a prefix in this case, and this is an example using an IPv6 prefix, if you see down there, 28039910 colon colon slash 32, and I'm not disaggregating this, I am publishing this completely in slash 32, then in that part, up, up, up there please, in this part here, I'm going to enter the prefix length, which is 32, and the maximum length, which is 32. I'm not breaking that down. So which is the autonomous system I'm generating this with? This is the only information that we have to be clear as to in order to create the rowers. Then you have other options to create these. Por ejemplo, de crear muchos. You have the option, for instance, of creating a lot of ROAs for an autonomous system. Many. ROAs for uh, an autonomous system, and there this uh, here you have all uh, the IPv4 and IPv6 addresses that I'm uh, publishing in that uh, autonomous system of origin. So, and when we create, we put that information, then it will list each of the ROAs that we have generated. We save them, and uh, to your right, you will be able to access the certificates that you create through the system. You may realize that it is not a difficult task. In this case, here we have ROAs created by us, and we say that we have a slash 34 in IPv6, and we are disaggregating it in into a slash 48, and that is being published by the autonomous system 64, uh, 635. And that slash uh, 34 is disaggregated in slash 48, and we are publishing it through the autonomous system 64536. So you, there you have the two certificates indicating the two uh, autonomous systems with which I'm originating that route. Now, when we create these certificates in the Milaknik system, we won't generate any, we won't cause any harm to the operations or to our network. Uh, so there's no, um, you, you don't, uh, won't uh, affect uh, what is uh, uh, working in our infrastructure. So please notice that uh, we are uh, generating information of the internet, regional internet uh, registries so that we can have those certificates that we generate in the database. And you can start delivering that information to all the uh, validators that are active at a global level. It's not that we generate that ROA and we will have any um, uh, uh, service de um, uh, um, down because we are generating those ROAs. That won't happen. It's 11.03, so let's stop here. Now you'll have a break. There is coffee outside. There's coffee for you to wake up, and hopefully in the second part, you may be more active, ask questions, and uh, if you uh, you can use the microphone. In the second part, we see an RPKI validator. We'll enter a validating software. We'll see how we can get the information. And this is quite interesting because this is what, what, what you're going to see today is what we're going to implement in this afternoon's lab. 
in this afternoon's labs. You will have the virtual machines, you'll have the validators, you'll be able to configure and to see everything we're going to explain now. Okay, so we invite you to the break, 30 minutes. The break is here at the convention center. We'll be back at 11.30 local time or 15 uh, UTC, depending on where you are. And at 11.30, I wanted to tell you about the rest of the tutorials that are starting now, the IPv6 only, in the Joao Avalanche uh, Hall 4. In Joao Avalanche 3, uh, the administration of Milaknik uh, resources and the security mode. And here we'll go on with uh, this tutorial on new trends. Uh, and in the next uh, session, we're going to see a demo of RPKI and we'll see the new proposal and the new trends where we are heading with routing security. Goodbye.